over the years, I guess maybe I've enjoyed more of the naturalistic approach rather than the uh, bookish one that's thought out ahead of time. Matter of fact, uh, was it um, Kenneth Callahan who said, if you uh, uh, think of it beforehand, it's decoration. Otherwise, it's art. The Pike Place Market, Westlake Center, the Seattle Aquarium, the Federal Building, Key Tower, these are just a few of the landmarks that show the hand of Seattle architect Fred Bassetti. Beginning as a one-man firm in 1947, Fred's accomplishments include schools, libraries, a performing arts center, and many private homes, not to mention the American Embassy in Lisbon, Portugal. Even with that kind of skyline portfolio, Fred Bassetti's legacy is likely to be his mindset about architecture's role in our community. He claims he's retired, but you can be the judge of that. Recently, we caught up with Fred at his Portage Bay home and office. Hey, Billy. Hey, Fred. How, How you doing? How you doing? You been taking a walk? Yeah, just around the corner here. It's a good neighborhood. Good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you, too, man. Good to see you. This house looks hand-built. Did you hire an architect? <laughs> well, come on, let's go in and take a look, or lead the way and show me what you've been doing. Well, all sorts of things. Come on in. Hey, Fred, this is fantastic. That's a good place. What a view. Let me open the place up. Really? Those windows open? Yep, it all opens up. The whole place is kind of open. Yeah, that's great, man. You ever just uh, dive off the dock there? Oh, yeah, sure. All summer we just go out here and jump off the dock and go swimming. That's one th reason I like this place so much. As a matter of fact, I just rebuilt the ladder that comes up from the water. Has a, has a duck ever flown in here? <laughs> no, but raccoons come in now and then. Fred, come on over. Let's get some tea. You got some tea or something? I'd I love some tea. You, Let me move the plant a little bit. This mind? plant yeah. lives on the deck normally in summertime. Yeah. But in winter, we move it in because uh -huh. the jade plant doesn't like the cold weather so much. But it's grown so big. It was a little tiny thing about this big when Ibsen Nelson gave it to me many years ago. And of course, being outside, it grows up in the summertime. And then we move things aside and it becomes part of the living room. Well, let's talk about Ibsen and George and, and George Barthwick and uh, Victor Steinbrook and the rest of the architects who designed the city. And most importantly, of course, Fred Bassetti, because you're here. Well, I'm a survivor. I miss my friends, George yeah. and Ibsen, so much. Yeah, I miss them Terrific too. Terrific guys. Somebody has to survive, I guess. It's a nice table. Well, that's built on the deck out here. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, Fred, you know, where did you, I mean, are you, uh, what school of architecture do you come from? Well, I was in <clears throat> school in the 30s. Yes. Right at the heart of the Depression. I well, started in engineering, but I switched after half a year into architecture. And just here across the Portage Bay, <clears throat> went to school. Is that where is that define you as the University of Washington architecture? Is that where you were defined? Well, or? that's where I start. I don't think I was defined there, although we had some good teachers. Yes. And some ordinary ones. What what is the defining moment in your your youth? I guess it would be as, as an architect. It would be architect. Is it uh, well postgraduate studies or your first commission or? I don't know if there was a defining point. It took about ten years to. Uh, uh, shake off the influence of uh, the early modernists, <clears throat> Walter Gropius, um, Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier, who were my original heroes. Well, I guess Frank Lloyd Wright was an even earlier hero. And you shook but, them off? Yes. Well, I don't think it's a healthy thing to uh, continue with those college influences. Uh, That's the Bauhaus. As a matter of fact, my house the first house I built for myself, designed and built for myself, was up on Hilltop Community, up in uh, south of south of I-90 over in Bellevue. <clears throat> and I 
build a long, flat-roofed, pure, crystalline thing. You know, <laughs> that was the idea, to be as pure and crystalline, you know, the pure crystal of the wise. At any rate, it took me 10 years of going up on the roof in my pajamas in the <laughs> middle of a rainstorm and a raincoat over them, patching the, the holes in the roof, trying to find where the water was coming in on this flat roof. Uh -huh. Finally, after about 10 years of that, I realized that that was ridiculous to build a flat roof house in Seattle, even though we used to claim it could be done without leaks, and I'm, I guess it can be now and then. But from then on, I let climate and uh, local conditions and materials and uh, customs prevail. The customs, you know, there was a great saying by somebody whom I never met, a guy named Schaefer, I think it was Marshall Schaefer, who said, a f uh, fool can put on his own clothes better than an expert can do it for him. <laughs> and uh, something we shouldn't forget. Well, of course, I was trying to be the expert when my early clients said, but, but don't flat roofs leak? I would say, well, no, but this was back in the 50s and 60s, 40, 50 years ago. Oh, no, technology has got it worked out now. Of course, it hadn't. I was what? just talking through my hat. What? I was sincere, but uh, experience shows that the traditional way often is the best way. Not that I'm a traditionalist architect. I was a modernist from the beginning, and perhaps even more so, but the genuinely modern architect will learn from custom, he'll learn from nature, particularly from nature, because nature usually does things right after a billion years of trying and making mistakes. And a modernist is defined as? Well, just anything, throw out the past. Throw out let's, the past. Let's so. go into the future. So you we were, can't wait for tomorrow. Sort of, you were the, you were, you were the punk artist of your day. I don't yes, know. that's right. Uh -huh. Of course, we didn't know what we were talking about, uh, except that every student, I think, should rebel. If he doesn't rebel, what kind of a student is he? Is that 66 years ago? No, no, Hard forget to it. Believe. That was a, yeah. <laughs> well, when I was uh, 19 or 20, uh, in those days, they taught us in the uh, classical Beaux-Arts tradition. It was a, um, I, the first, first problem I ever had was design a baluster. You know, r here's your porch railing, and here are the, the posts under the railing called balusters. And they, well, they started us with a traditional baluster with a fat leg like, that, like a piano leg. That was the first problem, design a, a baluster. I didn't know what a baluster was. And uh, then a, a Corinthian column, a capital from a yeah. column yeah. with all the acanthus leaves sticking out. Now, remember, that was my first day, a watercolor of a Corinthian capital. I wish I still had it, but uh, we had a, that sort of classical Beaux-Arts education. Uh, very quickly, of course, we rebelled and against the old-fashioned uh, training, which came from France at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Fontainebleau, just south of Paris. But we all, of course, as students properly do, rebelled and became modernists without much thought. As a modernist, what would instill you to have the vision to save the city, to make it livable, to, to work on the market? Well, as we became more and more confirmed modernists, we also realized what there is in history and that uh, you can build all the modern buildings you want, and I'm a full-grown modernist. That doesn't mean just of the architecture of the 50s and 60s. Uh, to me, modernism means that you just do what makes sense uh, in your, your own time, which and I, of course, I've grown to feel that learning from nature and from people and people's needs, just like Jean Godden said in one of her columns once, she says, a building should look out to me, it should open its arms to me, welcome me in. If it doesn't do that, what kind of a building it is if it doesn't welcome me in? Which brings me to the thought of some buildings that are under construction in Seattle now, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> I remember, though, meeting you at, at uh, Brasserie Pittsburgh and the market you were with. Uh, Ibsen Nelson, and, you know, noted for the, uh, the Flight Museum, Victor Steinbrook, the mm -hmm. Save the Market campaign, George Bartholik, uh -huh. who was the master architect for the market renewal, and, and you're the survivor, but those are, those are great days, and you gentlemen architects defined the city, and I remember you would, you would take the pens and you would be at the brasserie drawing on the tabletop. Well, to a certain degree, of course, architects are noted for drawing on napkins. Yeah. And when you start your uh, designs, like uh, if you first come to a building or an idea, do you start with a sketchbook? Is that where you begin? Usually, yes. 
Can, do you have still have the memory of like, for example, the uh, the federal building? What's the, what's the key? What's the basic shape or sketch that you're? Would you draft? Well, sure. Well, I think most architects uh, work this way. You don't start with shape. No, I don't think you do. Maybe a, maybe a composer starts with the melody. What is an I suppose shape is analogous to the melody in, in music, but uh, what we uh, every architect I'm sure does it differently. Yeah, and uh, the way I approach a project is to try and understand what the client needs. In the case of the Federal Building, they needed sure. an office building. Right. And uh, they didn't know how high. Or finally, they decided on the site, which was a block in downtown Seattle, along First Avenue. Here's mm. there's First, here's Second, and uh, here's Madison. And here's uh, Marion going up the hill. The waterfront is down here on the west, Puget Sound. Yeah. So I look at it and ask myself, if for an office building, how, how would it fit on that site? And finally, working on this, I got the idea, which I didn't follow up on. I should have. I think it would have been better. But you don't know at the time what the client is going to allow you to do. Yeah. So you're walking up as a, as a pedestrian. You stop for the stoplight here. There's that light out in the center, and when the cars are stopped, you go across, and what makes more sense than to kind of go in on the diagonal from the corner, which is where you usually, and it works both ways. You come in on the diagonal toward the entrance of the building here. So it would make sense to put the, uh, an entrance straight on. People don't walk in curves. They walk uh, sort of in a straight line once you get there. So from either side, if you had the building on the diagonal, right. it makes sense to have it that way. Uh, that never uh, happened, though. It, no, it didn't happen, but I'll tell you why. I thought, gee, one building in Seattle on the diagonal out of all the other buildings that straight on. Great. It might be great, or it might be kind of thumbing its nose as the pre at the gridiron of Seattle. I see. But once we, I thought it might be pretty good sense. I don't know if the feds would like it, but I called up Perry Johansson, who was just then working on the uh, Seafirst building, and I said, hey, Perry, if I'm working on this building that I might put on the diagonal. But I'm a little worried about one building out of all the other buildings in Seattle on the diagonal. Is that, is that standing out too much? Is it saying, look at me, which I wouldn't like. And I said, L why don't we have lunch and talk about, you're, wor you're working on a tall building up there for Seafirst, and I'm working on this one for the feds. Let's discuss it. Minus, I'm thinking of the diagonal. But if there are two buildings that spoke to each other acro across the city streets, it might, be, might make more sense if there are at least two that related. He says, I'm not interested, Fred. <laughs> that was the end of the building on the diagonal. Uh, so we finally did it with the building here. And this is a big mistake of mine. At any rate, the building is here, kind of squarish. Architects make mistakes? <laughs> we don't admit them too much. But at any rate, the building got on the, on the parallel to the streets. I, I think it probably would have been better on the diagonal. But at any rate, we put a big uh, plaza out in front. And you've got the Noguchi sculptures out and there. And the Noguchi sculptures are out here that all relate to the entrance. Now that silly entrance that architect from San Francisco did doesn't relate to anything. Well, at any rate, that's that's another thing aside. Well, tell me about the future. What What's the future of Seattle going to look like? Is it is it going to be a city that welcomes us in? Uh, are we making the right moves at this point? It's hard to say. I think we have a new city hall that welcomes you in, although I have other thoughts about it. We have a new library still under construction. I'm not certain that it welcomes you and I have a, it looks a little hostile to me, but it has other wonderful qualities. Uh, I look at every building though in that way. Is it something friendly? Is it something that fits in? I don't mean they have to be slavishly imitating or kowtowing or bowing down to their older neighbors, but it seems to me just as in human relations, we shake hands and we're nice to one another generally. Right. It's the way we get along. If, we're, if everybody is a, a buffoon and a baboon making trouble with one another, we can't, we can't live together. So there's a socially, uh, uh, social code of behavior among buildings too. Well, I was going to say, that, 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 explain that to me because, you know, Mayor Nichols is suggesting that we do away with a cap on uh, building heights and, and allow uh, density uh, all of Vancouver to take place in Seattle. Mm -hmm. and I'd be curious on your take on that. Well, I agree that uh, there, we should not have a cap on, on building heights. Matter of fact, I, I uh, would disagree with Vic Steinbrook, one of my best friends. 
um, he felt that we should have a cap. And Peter, his son, who was on the, who's president of the council now, worked hard to get that cap passed, right. that law passed before he was ever on the city council. Yes, he did. I think it's a mistaken thing to have a cap on height. I think the thing there should be controls uh, to make a, a livable city, but I don't think it's a cap on height that does it. It's a matter of bulk, and we see uh, buildings built that are so bulky that may only go up eight stories, but to fill the whole block. And that is kind of a... No, no setback. Bad, no setback. No I don't mean every building should have a setback either. Right. Uh, but hey, we should have light and air in the city. I think everybody will agree with that. Nobody knows except the parent how the child turns out, <laughs> but it's uh, it's fun to see it again. You know that the sides were tapered so that it wouldn't have to look straight across at that big black building across the street. Instead, the, from the side you look around it, and uh, it improves the view a great deal. And of course, the sloping roof sort of recalls the fact that Seattle has a rainy climate. The rain actually comes off, as most of us live in sloped roof houses, because it makes sense. And this is a recalling of that factor of climate. Oh, it's a, it's a good building for the city. I think it's, it's kind of like a truck that does the work. It's a workhorse of a building, uh, very stiff. It's probably the stiffest, strongest building in Seattle for an earthquake. Well, it's a lot of fun to see this again after so long. Anyway, it was a great experience. It's a real privilege to be an architect and be able to build something that uh, stands there and lasts longer than you do. Everything else is so ephemeral these days. having been a part of the growth of Seattle in the last 50, 60 years. My fir very first job was up here on Yesler Terrace Housing, which was up Washington Street, and uh, a fine job that was completed just before the Second World War. I was just a draftsman, I had nothing to do with the design. Then I went back to school, became a practicing architect myself. But uh, it's, uh, it gives you a source of pride, I think. Although, like your own children, well, who might have been the great Nobel Prize winner? Not many of them turn out that way, but they all have wonderful qualities. So you balance everything one way or the other. But I see buildings around, and I admire certain ones, and I am not so fond of others. The best architect does, does a building that, uh, well, that is uh, welcoming, that uh, welcomes you to come in. But any, if you do a building that makes a statement trying to show itself off, then it's dead. It's, uh, it's impossible to do architecture that is try, it tries to impress anybody. As soon as you try to impress anybody, anybody it's a, a phony gesture and it comes off as looking phony. And that's the trouble with so many buildings. They, they try to be impressive. We have a natural instinct to want to impress our friends. <laughs> And uh, as soon as we do that, it's uh, just as phony as if we ourselves were trying, putting on a phony face and trying to be other than what we really are. This thing is the hardest thing to figure out exactly which one goes where. It's unpredictable it's the way it goes. Triple helix comes automatically just by putting, if you put triangles, together like that and keep going you get this uh, endless triple helix which is a delightful shape I think. There's, one, there's the other one on a different kind of tower but the uh, triple helix I really like which is one of the first sculptures I'm going to do in bronze 
uh, this one. So what is it you're working on here, Fred? I'm not sure I understand. These are flexagons. Flexagons. They're, well, I named them flexagons. It's a, a name I appropriated because they're, tri they're polygons that are flexible, so I call them flexible polygons or flexagons. But that's a term that's also used for folding uh, uh, special mathematical geometrical shapes, which I really shouldn't be using, but flexagon seems so natural for this kind of a uh, t structural system. And, and what I intend to do, these are cardboard, right. of course, held together with rubber bands, just, just go over a flange at the end like that. And it works very well to hold these things together, and you can make almost any shape you want out of them. Is that your design? Yes. It's something I developed for children, a structural uh, system for a ch children's construction set many years ago. And now I'm using it. I'm uh, working on some sculpture, which will be outdoor sculpture, metal, non-objective, abstract. But I uh, rather like it. And uh, you can build all sorts of things. I built, you know, this is out of a three and a half inch pieces of cardboard held together with rubber bands. Uh, and you can make all sorts of things. Like here's the village we built at Hilltop Community, southeast of Bellevue, many years ago. This is about 80 feet across. The tower there is about 22 feet high. Uh, this is all built out of corrugated box board. And uh, we built, uh, we, I, with working with the children in our community many years ago, we built this whole village in, in four hours, one Saturday morning. It's um, something I'm just having fun with. You can make all sorts of shapes with it. Here's something that uh, you just nominated as octahedral decahedral <laughs> uh, dimpled surface. Yeah. Um, that's one of the shapes. Actually, this is the same shape as this uh, piece in the middle of the village, which was 12 feet high. That's the same shape as this exactly. What's this? I see you've got this other uh, <clears throat> document here, Action Better City. Is that uh, something you're working on? What's, what's no, that? No, actually, this is something from many years ago yeah. that uh, I worked on. As a matter of fact, the only important thing I ever did, I think, was to start this program called Action Better City when I was president of the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. When I was president of the chapter many years ago, I wondered what to do as president. And I didn't want to have meetings about how to raise fees so we might make a little better living. And I didn't want to have meetings to try and get more members. So I started this program which looked at the city called Action Better City. We looked at the city from several different uh, viewpoints. I gathered together about 50 young architects at that time. Really? <clears throat> And we did this program, which looked at the city uh, from several ways. We tried to find the places of the city that were not working well. Yes. Like Pioneer Square at that time, 30 years ago, was right. really pretty bedraggled. Uh, it was a Bowery. Wine out, yeah. winos, and so on. Yeah. Not, not to be disrespectful, but we thought it might be fixed up for, uh, and sometimes those places get gentrified, which we don't like. I like the old original, genuine place. This is the way uh, Gasworks Park started, you know. Yeah, Rich Haig's project. Yeah, Rich yeah. Haig's project. Yeah. Matter of fact, he helped on this too. What's we did the Denny Regrade Park, which is one of the projects <coughs> that did not get built. But it was a wonderful idea by Ibsen Nelson, which we later tried to uh, move over a few blocks on, as the Westlake uh, Mall. And so later we proposed putting this park all the way down to Westlake. But it got voted down by the commercial interests which is perfectly okay, but it would have been a great thing for Seattle. If I can claim anything, I think it's caring about the city, really caring to help build a cosmopolitan, wonderful city where people count more than anything else. You know, it's maybe funny to, for an architect to say well, that people count more, more than buildings, but it's true. <laughs> Well, Westlake at one time didn't exist as a square, as a plaza. There wasn't anything here. It was, it was a non-entity. What was here was the monorail station, the monorail that went out to the World's Fair in 1962. And what it was, was a station about uh, 25 feet in the, in the sky, up on the second floor of the building there. And uh, it was a big covered area 
in Westlick Square at that time. It wasn't a square. It was just a forgotten space under that station. It was a dirty place, flying newspapers flying around. It was a, just a dirty, dark space that was unused. And you'd walk through it and get out as fast as you could. And we looked at it and we decided to work on, on Westlake and make a wonderful plaza here, an open space. It was the only open space in downtown Seattle, really. It was a rare thing. Every city in Europe, and I suppose most of them in Asia, have open spaces, plazas, where the people will gather. It's usually the space in front of the cathedral. But this is a commercial area. So we didn't have a cathedral. But we had this unusual confluence of a diagonal street of Westlake, which goes down to, the, to Lake Union to the north, and uh, Pine going east-west, fourth going north-south, fifth going north-south, and now we have this wonderful open space that didn't exist. I, I feel it's a, <laughs> it's a nice thing to have done. I, I'm pleased that it, that it got done. But uh, it would help the texture of the city to keep some of the viaduct, but only here and there and the rest would open up to the waterfront as a normal seaport city should. <laughs> We're at the Athenian. I, I remember you having lunch here and you were you're having your bowl of soup and your roll and, and commonly I saw you with either Ibsen Nelson or with uh, uh, George Barthwick. And, uh, we were always talking about architecture and debating, arguing about what it was and what made sense, what made sense for, for the public, what made sense for the city. We were always trying to build a city. Do you see that fire in the young architect today? Do you see the fire uh, in the belly? Well, actually, I haven't, but I think that's because I'm getting to be such an old man, <laughs> and I don't know many of these young guys anymore. Uh, I seek out the ones that I think are the best and talk about it. I think as you mature, as you get out of your college years and your apprentice years, you begin to appreciate uh, the need for complexity and the need for responding to people, a more humane architecture. As we get older, we tend to do a little more humane and less artistic architecture, artistic in the sense of preconceived ideas. It's a matter of uh, philosophy, perhaps, how you do it, with an economy of means, but with a, a breadth of vision would be the best. Well, your breadth of vision has changed this city. I think it's for the better. Clearly, uh, it's created the future. Thank you, Fred. Thank <laughs> you.